poem I read you was to her. In the 28 years of their marriage, she never came to Minneapolis. Never visited my church. My father came twice in 28 years. So we only saw each other once a year or so, and the relationship with them was cordial, uh, but not deep. It never felt much like family, the new family into which he had, had married. So it felt like my father had been drawn into an intimacy that was no longer focused on the family he fathered, but the new relationship that he had with Levon and, and the place of Easley, South Carolina. My relationship with my father had always been one of admiration and respect and tremendous enjoyment when we played together or fished. I loved it. But we never talked much about personal things. And with the death of my mother and the movement of my father's heart toward a new world of relationships, the distance that I felt grew even greater. It never changed my basic feelings about him or for him. Admiration, affection, tremendous affection. In fact, one of the biggest emotions I think I felt from my father from 74 on was compassion. First, the loss of my mother and the end of a 36-year marriage and the pain that I watched there. And, and then second, the sacrifices that he made for evangelism his whole life long made me want to just rise up and bless him and, and affirm him and encourage him because of those sacrifices that he made. And then thirdly, because of his increasing dementia in the last five years or so. My emotional default reaction was never resentment. because he wasn't home enough. My reaction has always been, I love him. I'm thankful for him. I admire him. I esteem his work. I stand in awe of his fruitfulness and his faithfulness through so many years doing one hard thing after the other. I always felt totally supported by my father. I always felt loved by my father. I always felt admired by my father. He spoke well of me. He never put me down. He never, I was going to say he never called me names. Well, he, he thought I was crazy a couple of times. He thought I was crazy and he told me so for leaving Bethel College and my position as associate professor to become a pastor. Wrote a long letter of the litany of horrors I was about to encounter. And saying, with no small passion, you are John. I prayed that you would be Peter, but you're John. Stephen. You're not Peter. And I've been in 1,000 churches, and I would spare you this. That's the way he talked to me. In a long letter. I didn't save it. I'm not sure where it is. I wish I had saved it. I, I prayed long over that, and I, in 1980, became the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church, and my father immediately became totally supportive and just said, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> so it's always been one of support and love and admiration. During the years after my mother's death and my father's increasing inability to travel, God did an amazing thing for him. What do old evangelists do 
when they can't travel anymore. God gave him a ministry called Rod of God Ministries, which he did not plan. He simply wrote a 32-page correspondence course for ordinary folks And over the next ten years, tens of thousands of people were taking this correspondence course in Asia and Africa. And a ministry was born. You can go to the website today, www.rogma.com, and you'll read the history, Legacy of My Dad, and it carries on under leadership that he put in place. God gave him that, and it was such a gift because that meant he was able to to teach into a microphone and to write and to grade papers into his mid-80s. What a gift of God to a non-traveling evangelist. Only in the last couple of years was his memory so impaired that he couldn't serve that way. LaVon, his wife, died August 4, 2003. And after a brief stay in Anderson, South Carolina, near his church, and I publicly thank God for Oakwood Baptist Church in Anderson for loving my dad so well in Anderson, but he couldn't stay in the independent living situation. And so we brought him, my sister and I, to Shepherd's Care in Greenville, owned and operated by Bob Jones University. And we both looked at each other knowing this would be the last place that he would live and simply gave thanks for an unbelievably providentially sweet homecoming to the fundamentalistic bastion which had shaped him so profoundly so many years before. In God's mercy, his final days were brief and the Lord took him March 6th last year. My father's identity after evangelist was fundamentalist. By his own self-designation, and it is not a term of dishonor. In the first decade of the 20th century, liberalism was gaining a foothold in most denominations. The common word for liberals in those days was modernists. That meant there were people who, because of their understanding of modern science, certain essentials of the faith were simply not believable anymore. Virgin birth, miracles of Jesus, substitutionary atonement, inspiration of the Bible. These things cannot be, in the modern world, embraced. They must be demythologized in some way so that we can apply them in some vague spiritual way. But as far as being taken literally, modern people know better. And so they were called modernists. My father defines modernism this way. Quote, by modernists, we mean ministers who deny the truth concerning Jesus Christ, his miraculous conception, his absolute deity, his vicarious atonement for the sins of mankind, his bodily resurrection, his personal visible return to this earth. Modernists also deny the need of regeneration by the Holy Spirit and the fact of a literal hell. In other words, these days into which my father was born, early days of the 20th century, were days of a fundamentalist modernist controversy. And the battle was mainly over fundamental doctrines, the basic Orthodox Christian faith. The fundamentals were were published. The four-volume book, Fundamentals, were published two years before my father was born. J. Gresham Machen four years after my father was born, published a book not entitled Fundamentalism and Liberalism, but Christianity and Liberalism, clearly signaling liberalism is not Christianity, which it isn't in his view and my father's and mine. Two years Before he was born, these fundamentals came out. Harry Emerson Fosick, 1922, fired the shot across the bow of the boat church and asked, shall the fundamentalists win? 